my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Michelle Wozner at Seifert Winery in Dayton. It's June 2nd, 2020. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, first question, most important question, uh, why wine? Wine. Um, I've always had an interest in food and beverage and a background that evolves from the appreciation of food and beverage. And being original, born and raised Oregonian, when I came back to visit, I was taken to a private tasting in the Dundee Hills and all of a sudden there was this new industry. There was wine in Oregon, in the place I grew up where I was not big then. And um, I saw opportunity and I saw a new career and I just fell in love with it. Tell me about what you're doing. You mentioned being born and raised in Oregon and then, yes. you, and then you went away. Tell me about before wine, your life before wine. Um, so I moved to New York as a uh, young buck, kind of right out of high school, and received an amazing opportunity working in special events for a PR firm and a venue management firm. And um, at that point, I was able to kind of blend <clears throat> with people from all over the world and learn about their celebrations. And this is what I loved about event plannings. Um, runway shows, um, high-end bat mitzvahs, weddings, everything. And I just, I fell in love with it. Um, and a lot of music record release parties. And in that context, food and beverage were a huge part of that. Lining up everything um, specific to the requirements of each client. And that's where I started to learn about food and wine from all over the world, is um, the requirement of sourcing those things um, for people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after doing that and returning back to Oregon, I kind of had to unlearn all of that when I realized we have everything that we need that's perfect that's right here. Um, so it, it was really fun juxtaposition to kind of gain that experience and then come back and see, wow, where I grew up, all of that is just right here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. so what prompted the move back to Oregon then? You know, I love the city life, but I also was getting a little bit older and that hustle and bustle and the constant work to live um, was not as appealing. And so I came back to my roots. I came back to fresh air, to farmland, to agriculture, and um, was able to kind of breathe again. It was, it was um, a wonderful return. <laughs> And when you first came back to Oregon, tell me about what you were what you were doing. What what what, what was your kind of first step when you when you came back to Oregon? Uh, my first step was to work for um, a brand, and I did event planning and accounting for them. And I got involved with uh, student government at my local community college, and I took some political science there. And I was kind of just figuring it out. You know, a lot of people talk about their 20s where it's like, I'm just figuring out, I'm trying this, I'm trying that. Um, but I knew that I loved the skill set of food and beverage and the service industry. And that was something that I knew really well. So I continued with that. And as I started researching the area, I started wine tasting around the Eugene area and heading up north to this area and discovering that there's phenomenal wine right here. Um, with the idea to transfer and transition into that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you mentioned kind of rediscover discovering Oregon wine as as you came back as almost like a, 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 a as a as a newcomer almost at that yeah. point. Uh, tell me about your your initial impressions of Oregon wine as, as you uh, discovered it. Yeah, um, I fell in love with Seifert Winery's 2007 single vineyard Pinot Noir lineup. I tried all of them side by side, and I couldn't describe them. I couldn't describe it. The, the wine was complex, it was interesting, it was layered, it was nothing like I had experienced when I lived out east. Everything came from Europe or other regions of the world. At that time, drinking Oregon wine was not very common. Um, and so I knew that there was something here that I needed to learn more about when I, I remember staring at the wines, looking in the glass and, oh, well, what do you think about this? I'm like, I, I can't describe it. Mm -hmm. and, and that is kind of a, a moment where I fell in love with Pinot Noir as a varietal and also um, the terroir of Oregon. So as you 
set out at that point to, to learn more. Tell me about that process of, of learning more about Oregon wine and of how it kind of coincides with, with Seifert itself. Yeah. Um, well, I met my partner, Jim Seifert, at a wine tasting event and expressed interest in learning more about the industry. And um, I just started trying wines. I started doing sensory evaluations and opening up a bottle. Let's sit, let's talk about this. What do we think about it? Um, and one thing that clicked with me is I have some very serious memories of being raised in Oregon. Mm -hmm. Kind of one of them is on the Mackenzie River fly fishing in a summer afternoon. There's the aroma of the fresh water, there's the hay from the brush, um, there are certain trees. And I started getting these, these sensory flavors on my palate and through my nose in the wine of what was that sense of place, the terroir. And it just, I just fell in love with it and became a little bit obsessed with the fact that um, the wine, wine does capture a place and a time. And this was something that I knew. These were um, uh, moments that I, I knew that I had grown up with. And, and so that's how it kind of clicked for me and how I began to learn how to pinpoint all those different flavors and what um, clicked with my education mm -hmm. in that topic. So you mentioned meeting Jim at a tasting event mm -hmm. and expressing interest at that point. So tell me about the progression of that from meeting Jim to being here to, to be, and, and to being partners. Uh, at what yeah. point do you, what, how does it all kind of come together? What's the timeline there? Yeah, um, well, I, we met in the summer of 2009 and I came and assisted with harvest and a few different processes of winemaking, sorting grapes, um, fermentation punch downs, and I loved it. Um, it was very interesting and uh, very compelling. And um, there, there was this really fun chemistry of, wow, I can be, we can have a partnership, have a family and have a business together. And everything just kind of clicked. And um, it, was, it was pretty special. And I also, wouldn't imagine at that point in time if you had asked me hey are you, you going to build a life are you going to build a family are you going to have a family brand that you hope to hand over to two daughters in you know 10 plus years i i would not have imagined that um, i also would not have imagined falling in love with the process of fermentation <laughs> it's <laughs> it's um it's something that's alive it's something that, again, transitions those, those flavors. You can walk through a vineyard and smell the air and, you know, the dirt and everything that's happening. And in fermentation, I get that moment of connection mm -hmm. of those flavors mm -hmm. and in the finished wine. And so I think if you would have asked me at that point as well, hey, do you think you're going to become obsessed with this? I'd think you were crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have, is there a moment that stands out in your mind about that obsession? Is there a moment where you think, where you kind of thought, ah, maybe I could do this? Oh, um, yes, yeah. In 2012, it was my first year running the primary red fermentation program solo. Um, at that point in time, um, our oldest daughter was two months old. So I was in the winery and I had a baby in a backpack and <laughs> I was looking around at all the tanks and I always called the tanks my babies. So there was this whole moment where I was like, okay, well I'm making and doing and producing this for this, for this little nugget right here. She loved it, she loves it. She still loves harvest and you know, bosses me around and tells me what to do. It's adorable, she's a project manager. Um, but that, that was also a kind of a moment where it clicked for me because it was something where we weren't just making a product for people to enjoy, we were creating something that could potentially be passed down to the next generation, that could potentially pave the way for um, a stable life for a family. And that was um, an aha moment mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. 
I'm, I'm curious because uh, because Seifert existed as a brand before you came aboard. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about that kind of integration into someone else's dream. Uh, obviously, yeah. in this case, uh, Jim had started this uh, and you came in and became part of it. So tell me about that kind of integration and finding your role and finding out how, to, how you work together. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> And having a, a partnership, that's always something that evolves. Um, I think that it really comes down to two different personalities with different skill sets. Uh, when Jim founded the business in 2005, he started with one barrel. And that one barrel was phenomenal. And the next year, he had about six, and those were phenomenal. Um, I believe that he gained a 96-point recognition from Spectator. and that kind of set the stage for him realizing he needed to do it and continue it and expand. Um, and, you know, when I started learning about wine, I did not imagine to be um, taking this role on or to be doing it. But when you have a partnership where you're supporting each other, um, I think it sometimes it just naturally evolves into that. Um, and so we have different skill sets where we can excel. I love working with guests. I love hosting people, and that comes back to the experience of being an event planner. Mm -hmm. um, opening doors, creating a celebration. Um, Jim would love to pass that off to me whenever he can. He <laughs> like, loves like, like today, for example. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> Just like today. Um, but he, you know, will have everything lined out in a spreadsheet and all the details and everything logged in memory um, and is just not as social. Mm -hmm. So I think as our business and our roles evolved, our skill sets have um, mm -hmm. kind of blended in a nice way. Which, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Keep which going. is always great because sometimes if, if something doesn't come up in your mind, it might in the other person's and that's, mm -hmm. that's always excellent business partnership mm -hmm. and, and any topic. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you mentioned like your initial role was was a harvest, so kind of doing some cellar work, kind of the, the grunt yeah. work. Tell me about how that role has evolved. You mentioned being in charge of fermentation programs now. Yeah. So tell me about the evolution of that and what your how you view your current role here at Seifert. Um, we are very small business. We have one team member that works for us full time. So um, that feels like when you're running a small business, it's your own. You're managing all the aspects, and that's always something I've tried to share with any team members that we have. And so over time, I have um, grown into managing some of those things, and it's been, it's been great. Um, it's not always easy, because we're competing on a scale with other brands that have a lot of resources and more personnel than we do. Um, it being that I'm pretty much working full time and then we have one team member full time and, and that's it. Jim actually still has a day job. So um, he'll you know assist in the evenings and weekends. But um, kind of all of the, the responsibilities, if you will, that just, that just comes with the territory of you, you get your foot wet a little bit, but you're in it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because um, the business has to survive on your support. So it's everything from, you know, the glamorous things to cleaning out the fermentation bins, which is some of the, you know, the dirty work. And <laughs> How do you find a balance? Oh, you have to create a balance and if you don't stick to a good routine, then you aren't going to be successful. And I think with any, any business, any project, any lifestyle, you have to find the balance that works for you. Um, when you know you have harvest coming up, when you know you have a busy time coming up, you have to decompress before, during, and after, because those hours can get long um, and physically exhausting too during harvest. I'm, I'm curious, coming into wine as you did, uh, first from the kind of event planning uh, pairing point into the point of like intimate knowledge of your own particular wines, mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious at what point you started feeling comfortable making kind of judgment calls you have to make uh, on, the, on the wine side of things, less than the business side of things. I still always question that. Um, I heard from someone in the wine industry a few years ago at a dinner um, people were giving him recognition for, you know, you've been doing this for 30 years. 
and he quieted everyone and had a humble moment and said, no, I've only made wine 30 times, <laughs> only 30 times. And that's a really good, I just sunk with me and I was like, that's why, because every year that comes up has its different um, needs and evolution. And you really just have to go make those guesses and go with what you think you know and stick to your philosophy and your house style. Um, I think I've started becoming a little bit more comfortable with those decisions probably four or five years into it, having a few different vintages, a few different varietals with um, some great successes, some other things to get blended. Those, those, those things happen, they're, they're, they exist. Every brand has them. And that's one thing I've learned too over time is I've sat with um, peers in the industry who I look at their brand, what they've achieved, and I think, we have nothing in common. Mm -hmm. They have an entire team of 20 people that work for them. I'm sure their logistics and their operations are so on point. And they will admit something that I'm like, wow, I had no idea. You know, and, and it really helps even the playing field to gain that mental confidence of, yeah, everyone's mm -hmm. in the same boat when it comes to winemaking, which is kind of what makes it so fun. Mm -hmm. You mentioned philosophy and house style. How, mm -hmm. would you, how would you describe the philosophy and house style here? We try to be very hands-off with our manipulation and additives and let the Pinot Noir and the terroir show through and the vintage variants show through as much as it can while maintaining a quality product. Um, so that's not necessarily native fermentation. That is inoculated fermentation. Um, but with minimal nitrogen additives, um, minimal oak influence. So we guide it, um, but we do not try to conform it to be something that it's not. Whatever that grape is showing, um, we try to accentuate that. Tell me about uh, the growth of the business in terms of production and, and variety mm -hmm. uh, from when you became on board to now. What does what the growth progression look like? Um, it varies from year to year based on vintage yield, but also um, we've grown in white wine varieties. Um, those are being widely planted and also farmed very well. And as the industry has grown, we've been able to um, contract some really fun white wine varieties. So in any year, we'll have between six and 10 of those. So that's new and that's, that's exciting. Um, the Pinot Noir production has maintained and stayed around six to 800 cases of our house, but we've also grown the brand in other wineries, other vineyards that want their own label made from their own grapes, employing us for Custom Crush. Um, for me, emotionally, that's a huge compliment because when I have someone that has farmed their land and their house, their residence is right there and they come to me and they ask, will you make me a product with mm -hmm. my fruit for me to enjoy, for me to sell? It's, it's exciting mm -hmm. um, and I think it's really special. And so on some years, like 2014 for example, <laughs> which was a 40% increase of, of annual yield, in the valley, um, we bumped up anywhere to 3,500 to 4,000 cases from 1,000. Um, so we've had years where a contract has come up or a custom crush has, has um, come to fruition, but our main brand has maintained at a small lot so that we can ensure continuity. Because um, again, we're doing it all ourselves by hand. And there's only so many hours in the day. <laughs> I uh, mentioned cu Custom Crush, which is always an, an interesting question for me because you have your own house style and philosophy again, mm -hmm. and yet you're, like you talk about, you're taking someone else's kind of prized possession and turning it into wine. So tell me about balancing you, the way you do things with other people's needs when, and, and, and requests. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, usually sitting down with wine and showcasing, okay, if you have a white varietal, if you have a Pinot Blanc, this is how we've done ours, this is how it may taste. Uh, make sure that their preferences, um, that, that works for them. Or with Pinot Noir, um, we've had some years where the vineyard owners had a, what they thought was gonna be a great harvest and it didn't turn out so well. And we meet them halfway and we say, with what we have, this is what we're gonna do. 
Um, and I think that when you have a good relationship and everyone has a common goal of making a quality product, that is going to um, be something that works out for them and that if they're open-minded. And it, it's really about trust and um, companionship of we want to make something really great together. So you mentioned earlier that your 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 one of your specialties is the social aspect of things, that the, the greeting. So tell me about uh, a typical tasting uh, here in the tasting room. What what is it a uh, customer could expect coming to Cypher? One of our goals is zero pretension. Um, there are a lot of terms in the wine industry that, if you're new to wine, seem inherently pretentious. Um, there are some forms of service that seem um, uncomfortable for some people, whether they're new to wine or culturally it's not how they enjoy wine at home. So we try to make it about um, the experience of relaxing and enjoying the wine. Um, so one of our goals is to always make sure that we're very open and welcoming and we have really great forthright conversation with our guests and our wine club members. Um, we try to build those relationships. Mm -hmm. We do various flights where we can customize an all white wine flight. Generally it's half white and half red or all Pinot Noir of one year. Um, five or six single vineyards side by side. And that's really fun because it's a chance to discover the terroir of the different sub AVAs of the Willamette Valley and we can get into some of those technical conversations with our guests. Um, but one of our main goals is just to have it be fun and have it be relaxing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that means someone that's completely new to wine can walk through the door and feel like they have a good experience and someone who's been drinking Oregon wine professionally for years is going to go, wow, that is stellar wine, but they are authentically nice. They are down to earth. I felt like a valued guest. Um, because that's something that is big in the industry. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your, uh, the, the customers and, and maybe how they've changed. I'm, I'm always curious about this. You, you talk about getting kind of fairly deep into the conversation with customers in mm -hmm. terms of sub-AVAs and, you know, uh, is that the typical experience most people have that level of, of either knowledge or of curiosity about what they're drinking? It depends on where they gauge the conversation to go. I would say that that is probably 30% of our guests. Guests. And tell me about the, the role of food in your tastings and events. Yeah, um, so we have house charcuterie platters that we make that are enjoyment for um, just standard tastings. But we also do a lot of really fun events um, with food pairings that are hors d'oeuvres that pair with select wines and we spend months researching recipes <laughs> and doing test recipes for um, wine pairings and when it comes to pairing food with wine there are kind of two concepts or two ways you can go you can do complementary flavors so make a food that has a rosemary flavor that you find already in the wine and mm -hmm. it's complementary or something contrasting mm -hmm. you have a wine that's really fruity well what about having an hors d'oeuvre that's really briny and salty and has a very contrasting flavor and all those things create a sensory experience um, and conversation. And it, it's really fun to create an accessible way for people to go home and adapt it, adapt that wine to the food in their kitchen. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that we've really built into our wine club and our special events, and also something that can be made by appointment while um, tasting here. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh you talked earlier about kind of the your, your, your peers in the industry and, and kind of this, how you're kind of in a different a different ballpark than many of them. Yeah. But how do you go about selling wine in, in a marketplace like that where maybe you don't have all the advantages of, of uh, some of your competitors? Um, I think we try to platform what we're good at and what we know, and that is the the welcoming, open conversation, um, the food pairing. Um, the small event booking and every everything is different all the wines are different all the branding is different and so I believe as long as you have your own voice that that is going to show through with the correct demographic that's interested in that I feel that that's more important than trying to 
segment a demographic and speak to them. Mm -hmm. um, that may be right or wrong, but <laughs> that's where we're finding um, a niche for it, ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about the, the location here, obviously uh, in, in downtown Dayton, uh, right next, yes. to the, next to the, the great little cafe here. Yeah. Uh, tell me about uh, this space and uh, how, you've, how, how long you've been in it and how you've used it and maybe what your kind of future plans are. Yeah. Um, well, Jim found a building here in downtown Dayton in 2007 and purchased that and um, turned that into the production facility. We were able to expand into this tasting room when it was built about four years ago. And it's, it's been such a nice luxury for us to have a tasting space separate of the production facility so that instead of um, finishing production Sunday night and switching all the equipment into one corner and turning it back into tasting room. So that's hours and hours of, of switchover that was eliminated from our schedules and it's just been so wonderful. And with this space, we've been able to accommodate guests with some wonderful small events, um, an outdoor patio for enjoyment and more of a formal um, tasting space without the formalities, I guess. <laughs> um, having a beautiful area to overlook the park is awesome. Um, we really like being in downtown Dayton. Jim selected this area because it's right in the middle of wine country. It's centrally located to everything. Um, accessible one hour to the beach, one hour to Portland. You know, it's just kind of a, a really great epicenter. We envision staying here. Um, in any way that we want to grow, we want to grow our wine club. Mm -hmm. So that is our main focus, um, is to elevate our direct consumer platform. And how have you done that? How, what are your, what's the secret to elevating a DTC platform? <laughs> um, relationship building. Yeah. There are a lot of brands and there are a lot of wines that people can buy. Um, I think that as people evolve, I don't know if it's uh, mentally, emotionally, societally, people are voting with their dollars. I know that I, as an individual, when I go to purchase anything, whether it's um, produce, whether it's wine, whether it's supplies for my home, I'm looking at where it comes from, who it supports. Mm -hmm. um, and we feel that when we have great relationships, we see that that loyalty and that support um, and so that's I believe how we're able to continue and evolve in in that front so clearly we're, we're talking to you now in, in 2020 and yeah. as we're just just re kind of starting to reopen after uh, COVID-19 clearly still in the in the throes of that um, tell me mm -hmm. about how operations have changed here in the last few months and, and adapted to where we are now um, they changed dramatically and it was pretty intense. I know the world felt it. I know the wine industry and every industry. For some people, they were required to go to work still. Um, others you know, were mandated to stay at home. And when all of that kind of happened right away, and I realized that our guests were not coming into our tasting room anymore, we had to reach out to them in some fashion. Um, and then enter technology. And so we started conducting a virtual tasting weekly to create a form of escapism, to create a form of connection, to let people know, hey, we're here, we're still having you know, banter about food pairings, we're still using weird ways to describe the wine, you know, and just a moment of normalcy. Mm -hmm. And that worked really well for us and engaged our existing customer base and actually grew it. Um, which was such a wonderful surprise. Um, nationally, we increased wine club and um, shipments um, out of state during that time, which that response, I mean, I got really overwhelmed and I might now because it was just, you know, we're doing something right mm -hmm. and we were trying to connect and it, it resonated mm -hmm. with people. Mm -hmm. um, so that is what we did right when the guests were taken out of our space. We tried to meet them where they were. And now that people are coming back in, uh, we're on week two, no, week three now. The first week was a little bit hard um, because there are processes and procedures that do not feel hospitable. Um, they're important, they're required. I, I 
completely support it, but it's it's awkward to not hug some of my favorite people when they walk through the door, not sit down right next to them and say, "I'm so excited you're here." You know, that's the distance um, was challenging for us at first because it changed the nature of engagement. Um, but people were very happy to be out of their homes. People felt very isolated. So any sort of conversation in person was the right thing. And that's, that's what was happening. So that was good. And then the following weekend, um, people were much more joyous. Things were a little bit normal um, in a sense that we had a few days of service of these new procedures under our belt. Um, guests had ventured out places in their daily lives and they felt more comfortable going out in public. Mm -hmm. um, and now all of those practices on both ends of our side and on the consumer side seem to be uh, flowing a little bit more smoothly. Um, and I do find myself telling people okay, I want to carry this to your car for you or hand it to you, but I'm going to set it right here and then back away and then you have to go. You know, I have to, I sound a little bit like a, a broken record, but I really do try to remind people that our hospitality hasn't changed. These are just the requirements of what we need to do. And that resonates a lot. Um, even just saying that one little thing, because everything has changed uh, for a lot of people mm -hmm. in their daily lives and how they interact. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're just doing our best to maintain that. Um, yeah. I want to back up for a second to the, your, the first point you made about the virtual tastings. Mm -hmm. and, and, and obviously, uh, Oregon Wine Press took note, put you on the cover, and you mentioned, yes. mentioned the, so the growth. And that was, that was so, so cool to see. I'm curious, um, how, where did the idea come from? Why, why was that uh -huh. your initial reaction? And, and why so successful for, for your brand? So, the idea came from a previous experience I had. When I lived in New York, um, I was there during 9-11. And there was a sort of panic and a sort of shutdown, and I don't mean government shutdown, I mean everything stopped. Mm -hmm. The phone stopped, the cars stopped, the streets are quiet, everything was just still. And during that time, one thing that I saw happening in our communities that was so important was connection. Um, you didn't necessarily know where people were, um, businesses were open, and you just went to the local restaurant on your corner just to see other people and to take count of where everyone was. And then that became everyone's nightly ritual. Um, technology was not as advanced at that time. Phone lines were not working. Um, email, but you know, it's 2001. <laughs> it's a long, a long time, time ago. ago. <laughs> I don't even know if flip phones, you know, camera phones. I don't. I don't recall that being a thing. I recall pay phones, yes. Um, and during that time, I built so many wonderful relationships and had so much strength from connecting with the people in my community by going every evening at that restaurant and sitting next to everyone in our community. And people started doing that and connecting for their mental health and to support each other. And so I thought, okay, people need to be connected right now. This connection is really important, but we all have to be separate in our homes, but technology now exists and we can bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. And so that initial idea came from that experience. Well, the context is different. We weren't physically there. Um, we could still connect and maintain um, some sense of normalcy, some sense of conversation, um, which is why I named it Continuing Community Through Technology, because mm -hmm. that's that was the goal. And the goal was never to sell wine. I never thought I'm going to I'm going to write out a plan of what I'm going to sell and what my sales goals are. It was just a moment of we need to stay connected as as a group, as people. Um, yeah. Mm. So in addition, to, in addition to customers, obviously, this is known for being a, a very collaborative and social industry yeah. amongst, its, amongst the, your peers. So I'm curious about how that has been the last few months, staying connected to your peers in the industry and friends in the industry, uh, and if that has changed a, 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 at all. Um, the Oreo mine industry is com uh, completely collaborative. Uh, people share 
notes about their wines, about how they're overcoming certain obstacles in fermentation, how they're adapting their business um, to market changes. And this scenario um, didn't change that and increased that. So a lot of um, brands are talking with each other about how are you serving guests during COVID? What are you doing that's working? What are you doing that isn't working? How have you changed that? My county opens tomorrow. Yours open last week. What notes do you have? Um, all of that is great. And there are a lot of people who are showing up for each other in a sense that they're going to, to other brands and buying wine. And I saw a lot of that on social media. And that was awesome. Mm. I saw so much of, hey, so-and-so's delivering. Um, in this region and um, if you want to add our wine to that box or if you want to grab your own they'll all deliver collaboratively and it's something that the industry always does mm -hmm. and always has does so which at first threw me for a loop because I had just moved back from New York and in business in New York your direct competition was not necessarily your peer who's in your cell phone and you're sharing industry trade notes mm -hmm. like that's not mm -hmm. what I was used to um, it stressed me out a little at first <laughs> and I'm like is this really how it is this is how it is and I think that's one thing that makes it so special um, yeah uh, it, it's nice to know that hasn't changed it's nice to know that that has adapted with the times as well that kind of collaborate collaborative efforts uh, yeah. it, it's it's a, like you say such a the, the 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 reaction is always to like be close to people you know and to and to, and to share Closely, and so yeah. to, so to be to be a part. I was we were curious how that had affected. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, as you uh, as you sort of look back, uh, what, what you've seen in Oregon wine since since you've been here. What are the what are the biggest changes you've seen uh, in the industry in, in general since you've been a part of it? The growth, the immense growth. Um, the industry has what tri tripled in the last ten years. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Quadrupled in the last 20, I guess. Something like that. It's, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah, so it's exponentially growing, and I've seen a lot of great things come from that. If you would have told me four years ago that was going to happen, I would have been very skeptical. Um, being a small business owner and native Oregonian, when I saw really large corporations, international brands coming and buying up blocks of land in the area, I was concerned about my supply chain. Mm -hmm. I thought that my customer base, customer base was going to be redirected and that my supply chain was going to be affected. And that's not what has happened at all. Um, tourism has increased. There are new demographics that are now traveling to the area because of expansion um, and now with increased farming and more vineyards my supply chain has diversified um, in a really great way we had about three years ago a family brand come walk through our doors and say hey we've been selling our grapes to this really large brand and they blend them away we want a single vineyard and we want to work with you and i just was like this is the exact opposite of what I assumed was going to happen during growth. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that I've noticed is that they are also a family owned and operated small business. Mm -hmm. So we found really good success with partnering with brands that are designed like ours in terms of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's turned into such a, a wonderful thing. And because of the expansion, there are now brands that supply winemaking supplies, equipment, um, fermentation ingredients, they now have outposts in this area because Oregon has grown and is a game changer. Mm -hmm. And now I have access to better continuing education, mm -hmm. um, better products to make wine and better equipment. Mm -hmm. And that's been phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, I did not think that was gonna happen when I saw kind of a big land grab as i like to call it that happened a few years ago and in a large expansion so i think it's been great mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. what about as you look ahead to the future for the industry and, and obviously ha and have have your thoughts in the future changed uh with uh, our current situation here yeah it ha it has changed um i worry about premium and ultra premium brands and whether they're going to be able to survive on the shelves of um, small sh wine shops 
and in grocery stores and I worry about if consumers are going to be able to continue to spend premium price points mm -hmm. on nice wines. Um, so I'm always trying to understand what the market is showing and if that's going to change mm -hmm. um, because that will ultimately affect our success. Um, in the past with various economic changes we've been pretty quick to react um, with our product lineup and I feel confident that if we can go back to some of those good solutions we've discovered in the past that we'll be able to mobilize mm -hmm. but it's just I think important to always stay aware and see what's happening um, and react as quickly as possible if you can mm -hmm. which is a little bit challenging when you make a product once a year and then you age it for a few years <laughs> prior to release a couple times you've talked about the kind of once a year, one one shot. Uh, how do you, uh, as a uh, emotionally, how, how do you handle a product like that with that, that's so, I guess, demanding in that yeah. way? Yeah. Um, well, the, I don't think the wine industry is for the faint of heart, <laughs> and I don't think winemaking is for the faint of heart because there is a lot of emotional turmoil that can get caught up in that that process um, but I think if you have a smart plan for having a, a diversified portfolio with entry level and ultra premium price points and everything in between and you have a plan for producing those that you can um, react quickly mm -hmm. to where those products could go in the market um, that's not always an easy decision to make um, you know, in 2008, a lot of brands had to declassify some of their high-end single vineyards into daily restaurant brands. Mm -hmm. um, we may have done that in the past as well. And that's, that is a heartbreak sometimes because you know the time, the energy, and the extra love that goes into something. Um, but that's just part of business, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what about uh, the future for Seifert? What's, uh, what's on the horizon for you? What are you maybe hoping for in the next five, 10 years? And what do you kind of foresee? We're hoping to continue to grow our um, wine club, continue and increase our events on site um, in terms of private parties. And we have in the works um, batches of small lot, very, very pampered wines that we've been making since 2012 that we'll be releasing soon. Um, and they are wines that are completely different from anything that we've made stylistically and varietals. Um, and so I hope to see that launch soon, but that was a concept that we developed and created for our daughters. Mm -hmm. So it can be something that is for them to grow into. Um, and in terms of growth, I, we don't see size increasing of our production. One of the goals is to remain the same size so that we can continue with quality. Mm -hmm. And I have a really great team member who's working for us full time that I have known since I was five years old and I hope that she'll continue to be part of our wine family and that we can keep her happy here and mm -hmm. that's the goal. Um, it's a long time to scout a prospective employee. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> I like the diligence there. That's good. <laughs> uh, you talked earlier about the, the the kind of how you never would have imagined this partner, the idea of having a partnership and a family and a business all, all together. Yeah. I'm curious about that. How you how, when when you're so when it's when all of your life is tied together to a family like that, and you have a business together. Yeah. What about the how you manage that uh, when it's when home life and business life are so melded like that. It is a challenge. It can be um, really wonderful and it can make things so simple because you're so integrated. And it can also um, be a challenge because of communication styles and differences. And one thing that has helped us be successful in our personal and professional lives is really great relationships with other brands that are the same. And I will call, I've, I've made a phone call during harvest, you know, when your husband says this and you're thinking you need to do that with the wine, what do you do? Yeah, I, I've done it, and I've received great advice from other brands that are, are the same. Um, friends and family who have those same dynamics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's continuing that communication that's helped us to evolve. And 
But it's also so special because at the end of the day, that's your ultimate goal, is to create that product that's going to be successful, to try to create that um, long-term financial stability for the next generation. Mm -hmm. And so when that's the goal, uh, to me, other things seem unimportant. Um, which is code for pick your battles. <laughs> <laughs> and you talk about the second generation and, and setting this up as sort of a long, like you say, a long-term goal for them. So tell yeah. me, tell me about what would be the what, what's what's the ideal scenario as you, as you look ahead to, to uh, when it's time for you to step away from Cipher. Yeah. Well, um, both of our daughters love harvest. They love grapes. They love winemaking. They love being in the tasting room and trying to give guests crackers and napkins and and because it's all they know and it's what they've grown up in. Um, I have literally raised them with me in the winery. Um, so at this point in time, it is what they know. They each have a distinct personality that one will most likely do the winemaking and one will most likely do the sales. Um, but they're, you know, we support them to do whatever they want. And it's possible that this might not be what they choose to do, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's it's a wonderful goal for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. What would your words of wisdom be if someone came to you and said they wanted to join the Oregon wine industry tomorrow? Ooh. Oh. I would probably ask them to reflect on a few things. One, what skill set do they have? What character traits do they have that they can apply to this new career that they're good at? Mm -hmm. So you have to focus on what you're good at and what you can do within that career that you're good at. Because otherwise, it's going to be moving your own pendulum to something that might not transfer. Um, and also, look at what brands you want to work for, look at those ethical and integrity values that you value and align yourself with that. Um, within, with any business, there are always different practices and different sizes of brands and different models of whether it's international distribution or 20 mile radius local um, and figure out what sparks you and what your interests are and then align yourself with that um, and it's all about learning. The great thing about wine is that in order to learn more about wine, you just have to drink wine. You just have to try it. You just have to open the bottle and go, okay, I like this, I don't. Mm -hmm. And that's always a great starting point. And when someone asks, well, where do I start? Open a bottle. Mm -hmm. That's all the questions that I have for you today. Cool. Is there anything we didn't uh, cover that we should have covered anything I didn't ask that I should have asked no that was really fun all right excellent <laughs> well for me too that's great <laughs> cool. well thank you so much for joining us today for, yeah. for sharing your story and your and your wisdom here and we'll go thank ahead you. and let you off the hook awesome